that one out. April edition of Tips and Tricks. And I sent out uh, some topics for us to go through. First, we'll have our open forum, then we can go into topics with basically all rolls in together. This is post eclipse. As you can tell by the picture over my shoulder, that is one I took with my camera, uh, just pointing it up at the sun. I have a, a super zoom camera, so no filters, just shot this shot and, and took a few and enjoyed it. So that being said, who'd like to open up the floor with the first question of the evening? All right, that's good. We got no computer issues whatsoever. What's a computer? Yeah, well, that's <laughs> one of the, uh, that, that, that does bring up an interesting point. What is a computer these days? But it's not a cell phone. Even though a cell phone is a computer, they don't act like one, which we all find when we try to use any of these mobile apps, they just don't seem to do what you can do on a PC. Well, you never had the experience then of using a Chromebook because they work like an Android phone and a Chromebook. Okay, which I could I could see that being the story too. Uh, basically, I'm sure those come up and pull in the mobile version of a website. So when we were traveling to go watch the eclipse, um, there... I had done a lot of my research of where to go, what the cloud forecasts would have been, um, going to all these various sites, and I bookmarked them, and then I emailed them to myself uh, so that I could pull them up on my portable device, my that is my Android tablet, and everything looked different. Everything performed differently. I wasn't able to get the detail of information that I needed to, that I could get on my PC, but I couldn't get it on my tablet. Uh, same thing if I tried pulling them up on my phone. It, nothing worked the same. It does not work as good as it does on a PC. So it's just an interesting perspective. Um, my wife, who was trying to do a real estate transaction while this is all going on, um, she had done all of her legwork on her PC, but needed to finish it all on the phone, on her phone, which she's done before, but she's, it's just so cumbersome to do this stuff on a phone that she normally could just whip right through on the PC. So she even was commenting to me about the fact that it just doesn't work the same or as well on a portable device as it does on a Windows platform. Yeah, but look at all the younger generation. The only computing device they have is their smartphone, and that's it. Yeah, and it's, yep, it, and younger meaning anyone less than us. We less. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let, let's put that in perspective. I, I mean, there's people out there that I'm watching, they're 40, 50 year old people or less, and they're just trying to muddle around their cameras, are basically their, their smartphone, and they're wondering why they're getting such crappy pictures because they're really good at taking pictures of people. But not good picture, good at taking pictures of things like this eclipse. You know, it's just, you just can't do it very well. You need better equipment. For what well, maybe the next iPhone that uh, costs two grand, uh, uh, they'll have a, a camera that's capable of uh, uh, taking a, a shot of uh, uh, an eclipse. Oh, maybe, but I doubt that. Not for, two, not for two grand with the number of pixels that used to be on a thirty-five millimeter piece of high grain film right how many pixels is that piece of uh film you got that in. it depends on the uh uh that's quality an of that's, a, that's an I, analog I thing. The, high, the high grain old black and white the tri-x was like a he's like about you. ten thousand 10,000 grains per square millimeter. Oh, Ooh. okay. You're, you're down to the chemical levels with film. Right. So even though it's analog, but there still is grains on those things. Yeah. So, you know, I never tried to compute and see what this, you know, while we're talking, Pete, why don't you quick, quickly Google and see what the translation is 
and let us know where to come up with. This is an interesting <laughs> subject here. So we got the clips. I'm making notes on what we talk about. And uh, Well, one thing you see about clones today is they're getting bigger, but it's in length and width, not depth. So that's where you're losing the quality of the picture. Sure. Well, you're losing it both because the the, the analog range, the black range, was way higher on black and white. So of course. between white and black, but also there were more more grains per per uh negative side which is why they could take the 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 35 millimeter and blow it up to 11 by 17 with the high grain film without having any any deterioration yeah. and when they actually did that they, if they wanted to go further they would go and make an inner negative it like five by seven with the 35 and then they could go up to wall sides sure mm -hmm. That's why your your camera that went to the moon and all of the other ones, the Hasselblad, use a two and a quarter square negative. Well, so they, uh, they could take those directly up to the size. With uh, uh, regards to uh, Tom's uh, statement about uh, uh, the smartphone cameras, uh, at least for uh, iPhones, it may also work on Androids. Uh, they have clip-on lenses uh, to give you yeah. macro and telephoto capability. Absolutely. I wonder how those would work. But you're still looking at taking that down to a, a sensor that is like an eighth of an inch by an eighth of an inch. Right. Whereas the, 30, whereas the digital SLRs are... Uh, at least a third by a third of an inch. So they've already got 10 times the the number of pixels on a digital SLR, and that's not even anywhere near what a 35 millimeter film would be. Yeah, I know. I got I was a couple of uh, old uh, Coolpix uh, Nikons that uh, uh, I still use uh, periodically, Ned, and uh, with a neighbor uh, uh, helping out uh, <clears throat> with uh, issues of the property, uh, I took more photos in that uh, uh, session than I ever took in the whole ownership of uh, uh, the cameras. Okay, I found the answers. And Pete didn't jump in and tell us what the answer I, I tried to type it, but I <laughs> typed it on the wrong keyboard here. <laughs> okay, so it says film resolution to pixel count. Um, it says... Most scans of detail 35 millimeter photo, you'll need um, about 87 megapixels, <laughs> is what it says. I think that should be about right. I would have said camera resolution. Let's see what Leica says. <clears throat> of course, it's you know different interpretations of what this is. I was saying black and white film. Um, okay, someone else here is saying that a black and white 35 millimeter translates to anywhere between 50 to 200 megapixels. Well, there you go. The 200 megapixels compared to 87. Yeah. Well, I mean, the numbers keep going up, but they can also go down. It depends on... You know what's your, but they're they're I I'm not sure how they compute this. This was from a Leica website, and uh, anyways, this is a good conversation. But we'll just leave it. At. <laughs> <laughs> See what you brought on by bringing up the. Yeah. Probably depended upon the quality of the uh, the film too. Wasn't there okay. different qual qualities of film? Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah. yeah. So you could get you could get tri X, which is a lower resolution, black and white, but it had a high higher ASA. And then you could get the uh, 
there was one that was a like the spy film out of the spy film stock that had really high resolution, but like had a, a hundred and twenty. Tri X was four hundred ASA, and the uh the super high resolution black and white was like one twenty. And then on the colors, you started off with like a 32 SA, ASA for, for like Kodachrome. And when you went to uh, Ektachrome, you could get, a, get it up to 160 ASA. And if you went through special special processing, you could push the, the Ektachrome up to uh, 400 hmm. ASA. I used to shoot a lot of ectochrome because I shoot shot slides because they were cheaper. Because hmm. I wasn't have to, having to pay fifty cents a picture. Well, yeah, it was pretty expensive back in the days. You had to know what you were doing, otherwise you went broke fast. <laughs> well, in yeah. High, in high school, I had my own black and white uh, studio studio in my basement. Mm hmm. So I, I would buy buy uh, Tri-X film stock in the the four inch rounds and re reload the canisters for the thirty five millimeter. Sure, and my brother used to do that too. Okay, we're off in a crazy tangent here. <laughs> well, it is digital. We wanted to know how many megapixels. Does a 35 millimeter translate to? So we've gotten it kind of all across the board here. Uh, does anyone here still shoot in film? No, but it's coming back uh, from what I understand. I don't think it's ever left. Well, uh, uh, for professionals, they uh, uh, always use the film, but uh, uh, most people were not doing it. But I'm hearing uh, uh, more and more in the last six months that more and more people are uh, going back to film. Mm -hmm. maybe it's because of uh, uh, the quality and resolution of uh, uh, the film and uh, doing blow-ups compared to uh, uh, using uh, digital cameras sure yeah it, and the medical industry still does use film yeah called uh, x-rays I don't, you know, that one I don't know about. Um, I mean, even my dentist office switched over from yeah. film to digital. Yeah, and he's an old he's an old timer, but it was just it was cheaper and uh, no chemicals involved. Which is the other thing is, uh, if you're on film, you got chemicals. And now you've got to deal with disposal of those chemicals. Right. Uh, uh, it's only in the last few years that I've had to have an occasional. Uh, x-ray and it ain't film anymore it's a a, a plate that uh, uh, has uh, some kind of a digital sensor to the x-ray that's that is absolutely correct yeah but just think just think of the number of pixels on that that plate well i hope it's better than film because uh, uh going back uh, uh, about 30 years Going back about 30 years, I had uh, uh, special x-rays and that, uh, and they couldn't tell from the quality of the x-rays whether I had a problem or not. And uh, uh, now you bring it forward to uh, CT scans, they got uh, the uh, high resolution. Now you got uh, uh, the uh, electronic version of x-rays. I would hope that's got uh, greater resolution and clarity. The, the resolution you get in the medical devices has improved because the source is better. They've done a better job at aligning and refining the, the, the x-ray, if you will, so you get a higher resolution. They've, they've been able to work that detail out to, to maximize your output, if you will. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably equally as much as the receiver or the detector being able to pick up more uh, pixels because the source material is better. Yeah. So on, on CT or on uh, 
sonograms, it's digital in the first place. It never was photographic. Right. So as, as the memory is the memory and the computing power went up, the the resolution went up along with it. Right. Because now they can they can bring in all that data. They can process it. They were dealing with basically, you know, two eighty six computers versus uh, you know, you know, multi core processors that we have today versus the other ones, the old days. Uh, it's it all has to do with bandwidth, how much data they can deal with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, so now we're talking medical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good thing we don't have any computer problems. <laughs> when I had my last echocardiogram of the my heart, when they did a, a sonogram on it, I was actually looking over and I was seeing the heartbeat on the monitor inside the, the room. Isn't that pretty cool? That's real cool. That's really cool. You know, and being a, a scientific nerd because my life in the lab, I, I tune in on that, and then watching when he do, when they do the the uh, the opt the laser scans of the eyeball for my macular degeneration. Yeah. Now I've done that so many times I can actually tell the technician whether I'm going to need a shot or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I I remember going back because that's how my brain works. I compare. Hmm. So since I've done like 20 of them, I can remember when that those curves are and when I needed a shot or when I didn't need a shot. Got it. Since you brought up macular degeneration, um, you weren't at our West Side meeting, but uh, we did have an attendee that chimed in, Ed had chimed in and was telling me, and he presented to the group a product, a, a app, that you can load on your phone. It's called Seeing, that's S-E-E-I-N-G, space AI. Um, it's an AI app, obviously. It's free, it's from Microsoft. And when you load this app on your phone, it uses the camera on your phone to identify whatever it is you're looking at. And it'll give you a visible, a, a physical, I'm sorry, it'll give you an audio description of what the item is. Uh, it could be an OCR thing where you point it at uh, the label on a can of soup and it'll tell you what's printed on there. And it does this all in real time. It's not, not like you have to take a picture and then send it and then it comes back. It's doing it while you're pointing the camera at, the, your phone camera at the object. So I found this to be really uh, pretty cool. Um, let me think. There is think also a Android besides the iPhone version. Short to ML3. Phone plus But the other thing that uh, the uh, uh, software stores don't tell you, what models of phones and the version of the OS you have to have to make that work. Um, I don't, is, there, is there a limitation? I don't know. I I was looking to see if there was, and I uh, uh, decided to uh, to look at the Android uh, uh, store because that's uh, I have an Android phone, and I see seeing AI also in the uh, the Android store on an old I, old phone. Sure. But I don't know if there's Wait, a limitation. I couldn't again? find it. What's I the think name of the Go ahead. Here it says it's called Seeing uh, AI and it's uh, version 5.3. It says that uh, uh, devices running on iOS 14 plus. Okay. How about uh, uh, Android? Do you know that offhand? I, I don't. I don't know. I don't have an Android. You'd have to go on to the Google Play Store, right? Yeah, we, we can't do. Even when I was looking at it, I could not find such specifications like he just pulled up on the iPhone. That could well, be I, I, because 
Yeah, when I did, it, it tells you what's new about it. You know, it tells you about the version history. Sometimes it, on the Google Play Store, if your phone is not compatible with the product, it won't show it to you. Oh, okay. You might have to side load it to get it to go on there, but you won't be able to front load it. Well, see, this is an antique. This is a uh, uh, Samsung J2 Android phone. It's probably 10 years old. Oh. <laughs> and it's still in the Play Store on this device. But what's it What's it have, Android 4.4? I don't remember, and I don't really give a damn. Uh, I don't, I, it doesn't have cell service. I took cell service off a long time ago. Yeah. If you can't find it, it's because it's not supporting... Yeah. Uh, the OS that's on there. You mean the specification? Right, right. That could it be, but more, uh, I've never more, noticed that before. It needs a better, newer version of Android than what you have on your phone. Well, that wouldn't be a big surprise. That's yeah. why I was looking for what uh, 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 OS version you needed uh, for each type, and if need be, models of uh, the phone that uh, uh, you can use it on. Well, the latest version of uh, iOS is 17.4.1 that I have on my iPhone. Uh, let's see. Uh, Android minimum requirements. Da, 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 da. I'm trying to see if it if I see that quickly and it's it's hidden someplace it must be real good because i spent uh, uh, probably a half hour looking for it. boy and you said that it would required um ios 14 and up yet yeah. i'm seeing iOS 10 on one of them. Another one says iOS 12 and later. So which is it? Um, me, 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 money, mo. Oh, I see for Android, it does say Android 6.0 or higher. Okay. Well, that's And I would bet that your phone is running probably Android 4.4 or 4, probably 4.4. Could be. Well, if you turn it on and go to a, about and software, you'll be able to find out. Well, I'm sure of that. Uh, I know uh, uh, where the, uh, to find this stuff with this antique. Uh, I don't use it that way. I use it as a computer, mm -hmm. a portable computer. So back to Pete, you may want to check out this device that might help you down the line, get to okay. know how to use it. So, with my uh, my doctor, I know my particular type of macular works with the shots. Mm -hmm. So it clears up. And right now, I'm uh, about a year and a half from the last shot. So it's stable. I just got to be careful about trauma. And uh, I'm 20, 20 with the... Uh, The surgery for for the eyes for the uh, I had cataracts. Oh, right. cataract surgery. Okay. Yeah. Cataract surgery, and since the cataract surgery, the eye with macular degeneration in the past on it is twenty fifteen, and the oh, other yeah. eye is twenty twenty. Hmm. That's pretty darn good. Yeah, I got the info on seeing AI for Android, and I am going to copy some information into chat. Okay. See, Tim, you didn't look very hard because we found this within moments. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could have asked uh, uh, the AI assistants, too, for the could information. But I you didn't. just did. You asked me. The machines and I are one. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I can't tell the difference between you and the machine. Yeah, he's neither he's can a, the machines. He's zen. <laughs> the machine looks nice. He's zenned with his PC. When the machines take over, I'm going to be their handmaid. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. Now let's get serious and put this into chat. Android 13 and above. 13 and above. Okay. And I, what I say earlier, 12, I think? Yeah, well, it's 13.0. 13. 13. So, and I will more than bet that his phone is well earlier than that. If it's, um, but I'm just a guess. Why don't you find out? Look on that phone. See, the, go to settings and about. Version 9. Version 9. Okay. Well, that would explain it. Yeah. yeah. That's why you can't find it. Right. Because your OS is not high enough level. Well, I just better... couldn't find the specification. It's in the Play Store. Mm -hmm. And it uh, has a rating of 3.5 out of 4. And uh, uh, But I was looking for what OS is required, and I couldn't find it. Right. I went to the Softonics site. Ah. So I did not I did not do that on my own. That's where Google sent me. And if I had asked the AI chatbot, it probably would have gotten me there faster. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what version do you need? 13.0. Android. I'm in version 12, but it, I think I can get to what you're talking about. If you can get uh, you might be able to force it. Uh, it's a case where uh, uh, it, Android uh, uh, manufacturers don't support uh, uh, the Android upgrade versions that uh, Apple does on iPhone. Uh, with iPhone, you get five, six years. And uh, with uh, uh, Android, I think uh, the most I've ever heard of is three or four years. Yeah, generally two to four years, depending. Pardon? Two to four years, depending. Well, yeah, I but I've had uh, uh, some cheapy phones uh, uh, where it's one year max. Right. I what phones will generally do is I uh, each Android phone can usually be upgraded to two versions higher than what it came with, and then your SOL. <laughs> That's exactly what my Moto 4G did. And I think it's I still below. My I think my phone is still below Android 10. I can remember old phones where I never had to upgrade them. Oh, I always uh, 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 upgrade. No, no, they were connected to the wall. Yeah. <laughs> so what? It still needed to be upgraded. Otherwise, you were uh, uh, playing with dial phones all the time and uh, never went to digital. Bro, well, digital I, had level. Touch tones. I had the touch tones. <laughs> they're all digital now. They didn't. <laughs> no, you know, they're all going away yeah, now. I, that's not entirely true. Rotary phones are making a, a comeback now. Yeah, but the, uh, uh, the POTS <laughs> lines that supported them are disappearing fast. Yeah. Especially in uh, 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 right now, uh, AT and T I know has petitioned California to end POTS lines. Whether yeah. they get it or not, yeah. that's another story. Comcast just informed me that I uh, their I uh, voice is going to be upgraded to something more expensive. Well, uh, Verizon, uh, uh, you have to go wireless with them they don't support uh, uh the landline anymore hmm. mine is uh, a voip and i that's what it I could do. be with a wired or wireless or wireless but it's i uh, it does support the old phone cables the old phone cables do work with the jacks and they do it does connect with to the jacks for the old phones. Yeah, I use uh, uh, the Bafi 2 through my ISP, have uh, for about 10 years or better. 
Yeah. Well, I've still got a landline. I even have a a, a rotary dial phone. You know, <laughs> one of those old. Uh, there you go. You know, ones with the coin operated. Are you sure uh, uh, it isn't the uh, the crank type ones to get the operator? <laughs> no. no. We had that when I was a kid. You know, the one with the cradle and the, you know, the uh, thing for your uh, ear to hear. Well, you were on party lines back then, too, weren't you? Oh, yeah, oh. yeah, there was four party lines. Uh, there were party lines in the 1950s still. But later than that, because I, I went to do something for my mother back in the uh, well, late 70s, 80s, and come to find out that she still had a land a uh, party line oh, on the landline. I uh, uh, it was late fifties or uh, very very early sixties. Uh, we went uh, uh, off party lines uh, uh, where I'm living. So it might depend upon where you're at. Uh, uh, the well, more that rural out, that areas was out in Colorado. Uh, are always way behind, just like they are right now with the internet. Yeah. Okay, we got a few new people that popped in. Wanted to find out if uh, the new people that popped in had any questions for the group, computer-related questions or problems for our open forum session. Harry, do you have anything you need? Tom? Dick and Harry? Check the, let me check the topics for tonight, then I'll let oh, you know. All right. Okay. <clears throat> tonight, it's Tom, Terry, and Harry. Right. Not Tom, Dick, and Harry. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> we don't have a dick here. We don't have a Tom, Dick, and Harry. <laughs> so who wants to be poor Richard? I guess that's you. No. Nope. Okay, I sent out the um, list of potential topics and questions. If anyone want to take a look at it and see, I could put it into the chat. All right. How about the five common mistakes that'll damage or ruin your motherboard? Well, five common uh, mistakes that'll damage or ruin your motherboard. Uh, uh, when you take your garden hose to it uh, uh, to <laughs> clean it off, uh, uh, I'm sure something's gonna happen. <laughs> Overclocking is another one. Overclocking is another one that uh, uh, can, uh, d uh, on the serious side, that can be a problem. You're not only taxing the CPU and your memory, your GPU, but you're uh, affecting all the components on the motherboard that support all that stuff. Short circuits, power surges. Poor ventilation, incompatible components, improper handling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Static electricity, uh, uh, especially in uh, winter months, uh, uh, if you don't ground properly. Uh, Did yours actually open the link directly? Pardon? When yeah. You, okay. Because well, I tried it and all I'm getting to, if mine I, just took me right to MSN. That's right. That's where they came from. And that's why I said if I knew what they were, I could look them up and get the original article. That's what uh, I normally do. I, but she didn't what, do that. What I got from the link in the email was a version of the article where all I had to do was hit a blue button that said to continue reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yep. it stayed on the same page. Right. Oh. That's, what I, that's what I did. That's all you do is uh, click uh, uh, continue reading. Yeah, but uh, uh, if you want the real article, you take the title, you do a Google search, and uh, uh, find the one that's specified in the MSN article. I have to do that quite a bit. Okay, uh, just so everyone knows, um, Tim had sent me a different email that he normally sends out for the FYIs. Uh, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do this meeting tonight, so uh, if I was going to be back from wherever I was planning on being for the eclipse. So I was going to ask Tim to step in, take it, and take the reins, 
he sent me these links, which is what I created our, our topics for tonight, which is different than the normal way in which I would have done this. Um, that's why I'm having some translation issues, if you will. So uh, up on the screen, let's see what they got here. Um, I like the idea of don't pour water on it. <laughs> Definitely, that is. So we got short circuits, power surges, poor ventilation and overheating, incompatible components, and improper handling. Well, if it's in the case, I don't know how you're going to handle it improperly. But well, I will say... Improper well, handling during installation. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's for the uh, custom build jobs. Uh, whoever right. does the custom building. <laughs> Um, what they don't say in here is another one that could cause a melted board to fail, and that is insect damage. That is to say, spiders and creepy crawlies like to get inside your computers because they're warm, or there's constant airflow, especially spiders, because they like to make uh, webs inside there to catch any bugs that could fly in. <laughs> yeah, but that's and, uh, uh, part of uh, uh, at least a minimum of annual cleaning of uh, uh, your computer, uh, even laptops, because they're, uh, they're sucking in air. And uh, uh, two problems that occur is some people uh, uh, put the, uh, the uh, laptop on a, uh, like a bedding and or on oh, their gee. lap, and they're blocking the intake vent and therefore not getting enough uh, uh, fresh air yeah. to cool off components. Uh, but uh, uh, yet they all need cleaning out because they all collect uh, uh, dirt, dust, and uh, dust bunnies. Yeah, man. This, this is true, especially the point of what you were saying about uh, people putting it on their lap as in a laptop. Right. Yeah. And uh, my kids were really bad offenders at that they would love to use it while they were in bed at night yes and they have fuzzy blankets on the bed and they just let it sit on top of a fuzzy blanket and then their computer would shut down on them they couldn't come figure out why it may be calling me dad why is this problem here and it was because they gave the they their fuzzy blanket would cover up all the airports the that is the ventilation ports and so tim you're spot on in that one that was I ran into that so many times and had to clean out their computers, you know, with compressed air because of that, uh, the fact that they would put them on their blankets. Yeah. Um, uh, now, if you live in an immaculate showroom home, there probably will be very uh, uh, little need for an annual cleaning, but I would say every two to three years you would need to do so. But uh, uh, in the average home, there's enough dirt dust, and if you got oh. animals like I do, uh, you got animal hair all over the place, uh, etc. So the end result is you can uh, uh, easily fry out a machine. There's another one article in here uh, that's about uh, the right way to clean your uh, PC motherboard and why you should. And that's about right in the middle of the list. There, there is one more thing that they didn't state in there whatsoever in this article. Uh, I'm kind of surprised about it. Uh, those people that are cigarette smokers. Yes. Tobacco clings to motherboards. Um, oh, tobacco I smoke. To, I'm uh, sure Tim and others have cleaned out computers that have been owned by tobacco smokers. Yes. And found the insides of these things are just coated. You ought to see the home that they live in the walls yeah. the ceiling that's, that's yeah. i that's i had, I had a, a clean out a, a relative's uh, uh, place in that and uh, even using i think it's tsp you couldn't clean the stuff off you needed no. to uh, literally scrape the walls uh, uh, the whole top coating off in order to have any paint not have tobacco spots bleed through the fresh paint. Yeah. So, but we're back to computers now, not the. It's the <laughs> same okay, principle. So lost, it's, it's exact I same lost principle. Two pieces of, of equipment to creepy crawlers. Uh, okay. I I lost I lost a 
about a $700 color laser printer scanner, HP, Ooh. to a to a centipede. Really? That went in there and yeah, he got across the high voltage to the uh, <laughs> the filter <laughs> coil, blew the thing out. Amazing. And then, then a CD scanner, a CD play, multiplayer. I lost to a mother gecko who put her eggs in the damn tray. Wow. So the tropics have a whole different set of the rules. Oh, wait, are you saying this has all happened while you've been out there in Hawaii? Yes, yes. Oh. Wow. Wow. You need better screens in on your doors. <laughs> you can't. Nothing works. Nothing, Nothing works. works here. Nothing works. I guess you I've woken up and ha I've woken up and having a centipede walk across my house. A six incher. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you could put that out of taco and put some sauce on that. It tastes really good, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's now cooked thoroughly. <laughs> you put a little barbecue sauce on it, and you won't notice. So yeah, geckos here are everywhere. They're the they're the favorite game for cats. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should get a few for my uh, cats. Geckos. Okay. Two and three inch centipedes are no, are ordinary. Fours are a little rare, but every once in a while you run into a sixer. Ooh. And no suckers hurt when they bite you. Ooh. <clears throat> okay, we covered that topic pretty good. Um, <laughs> Unless anyone else wants to add to something. So, you know, it, you, Tim, you did come across, you did bring up the subject about doing an annual cleaning. Well, uh, it's uh, uh, in the middle of the list, uh, uh, the right way to clean uh, your PC motherboard and why you should. Okay. That's along the same t uh, uh, train of thought uh, for uh, the uh, five mistakes. Yeah. Right oh, way, right way. The right way? Oh, yeah. Well, are you, yeah. you, you rephrase that. You said the right way, but what is the right way? That's what's in the article. Didn't you read the article? No. Come on, I Tim. I didn't read the article. I thought it was on a list of what we were going to talk about. I'll read the article. Okay. Yeah, no, no. Tim is just having fun with you. <laughs> it's a, no. a, a case where you got to use uh, compressed air, and then you have to have like uh, anti-static uh, brushes because you may have to uh, use the brushes to loosen up more of the dirt that uh, uh, wants to cling, even with the uh, compressed air. Yep, that's okay. the best way to do it. it. Better your fans. You better block your fans. Yeah. You're using compressed air. Well, actually, you don't want to have those. Actually, your fans they, they will, uh, they will uh, really need a, a serious uh, cleaning, especially with the brushes. And you might have to dismount them uh, to do a good, uh, thorough job. And if they're making noise, you probably need to manually oil them. But there's a right way and a wrong way. Wait. Wait, hold it. Manually oil the fan that's yes. on the motherboard? Yeah, take, they may need you, to be lubricated. They yeah, may you need take to off lubricated. the uh, uh, little uh, seal that's uh, in the center of the fan very, very gently and carefully so you can put it back on. You uh, have little manual oilers uh, uh, with a needle that you uh, oil the uh, uh, bearings on and uh, uh, spin it around manually not uh, uh, with uh, compressed air. And once you uh, uh, do that, you uh, take a, a alcohol uh, cloth and uh, uh, clean off excess oil and then put that sticker back on because it uh, uh, blocks out a lot of the dirt and dust. 
this was a pretty short article here. Um, in terms of what to do. So what, in terms of one of the things you got to make sure that you do before you do anything is to unplug your computer. I hope so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Unplug it. Make sure that you discharge any static electricity that could be on your body. And uh, that is by touching the power supply on the computer to just to discharge any static buildup. Then you could proceed to blow out the computer. So you'll want to take the covers off and blow everything out of the PC, not in. That is when you hit the where the power supply is, you blow everything from the inside of the power supply out towards the fan, not from the fan in, but then you're just blowing the stuff back into the computer. Well, usually what I do is the uh, uh, exact opposite. I do the power supply first blowing in to loosen okay. up a lot of dirt. And uh, uh, because of uh, how it's trapped in there, then... As I blow out the inside of the computer, I blow the power supply from the inside vents out uh, through uh, the fan area. And it uh, cleans out the power supply a lot better. Uh, and uh, most of my power supplies last a pretty good lifetime. Right. There's lots of little tricks that you learn either uh, uh, by reading the articles or you uh, uh, or YouTube videos, and there's a lot of things you uh, uh, should learn from life experiences. Okay, um, keyboards, cleaning a keyboard. Yep, that's another one. One of the things that I always do when I come to it, when it, when I need to clean a keyboard and uh, is make sure the computer's off. Take the keyboard, turn it upside down, and tap it so the bottom edge is hitting the counter. The counter, so it's kind of like on an angle. Right? My hands can't show it correctly. Uh, so this being the table, this being the top of the keyboard, normally the keyboard would be this way. You'd be typing on it. You flip it upside down, and then you take this bottom edge here, and you tap it, boom, boom, boom. This is the way I do it, okay? Mm -hmm. Some other people are gonna tell you differently or and shake it a little. And this will get any of the, the loose debris that we drop like hair dander and nail clippings and uh, you know crumbs from your cookies and your- Chips, your, chips. Your yeah. <laughs> That's right, don't forget all those chips and salsa you oh, yeah, and chips, you've got the yeah. chip crumbs in there. So you wanna do that and just kind of shake it a little to get the stuff that's caught underneath the clickers, if you will, and get that to fall. You'll be amazed if you've not done this before on a, a standard keyboard, how much junk falls out of this thing. Yeah. Uh, especially if you keep the keyboard um, on your desk and open to the air that is not covered or on a slided tray where it could be covered up. If it's just out in the open air, Dust is falling on it 24-7, 365. That's right. Micro dust, we, we have so much dust in our house. It doesn't matter if you have the cleanest house in the world, you have dust. Yes. And that's because the biggest generator of dust is this person right here. We make dust. We make a <laughs> lot of dust. That's right. Uh, and uh, that stuff just accumulates on our keyboard, so you want to make sure you pound that out. And not only that, but uh, uh, on the uh, keyboard, uh, uh you have uh, uh, situations where uh, if you got animals, depending on the uh, individual animal, that you, they may contribute quite a bit to your problem as well. Well, you hit that one right, especially you, Tim, who have cats that love to walk across everything in your house. Um, he's Actually, got they eight stay cats. Off of my and keyboards. He's got, they stay got, off of my they keyboards. They love walking across your keyboards, and, and as they walk across, they drop one or two hairs as they're going across. And some of their their hairs can be really small, like the ones on their paws. Or as they're like the uh, ones that get my eyes. Mm -hmm. So that all gets accumulates inside there. And, of course, the animal hair and dander is floating around in the air. And that 
falls down onto the, the uh, keyboards too. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, uh, cleaning these things uh, can be uh, uh, very very challenging, and depending on your environment, uh, you may have to do cleaning more than once a year, maybe okay. uh, uh, two or three times a year. Keyboards I usually do several times throughout the year. Uh, when I was at had them in, at work, I was doing it probably every month. Uh, not that it needed it. It was just ha a habit to take this thing, turn it upside down, click, click, you know, pound it down a little and get a bunch of junk, sweep it away, turn it around and just keep using it. Um, it does help extend the life of the keyboard. Yes. Uh, anyone else want to talk about what, what else can you use? Compressed air on a keyboard, correct? Yes, you can. And that one's not an issue using compressed air because it's it just because there's a um, you got the way a keyboard is generally constructed unless they're a sealed setup is you have the printed circuit board then you have the mechanics above it that push a plunger down that when you press on a key you're pushing down on a plunger. And there's a little round thing that makes a connection to a PCB that's on the motherboard. And it's, it's just this little connection is all you're doing that tells the keyboard that that's the letter that you press. And when it's spring up and open, there's no contact here. That's where all the debris starts to accumulate underneath there. So you just need to basically sweep it out of the way and just blow it out of the way. If that helps anyone visualize what's going on there. Terry, when was the last time you cleaned your keyboards? When was the last time? Uh, when I bought it. <laughs> when you bought it. So that keyboard right in front of you, right now you have a keyboard, right? You can take, hey, uh, Terry, you can take your whole uh, computer with you when you uh, take your uh, next uh, uh, shower or in the <laughs> hot tub. <laughs> yeah. If you take that keyboard, other than a laptop keyboard, now we're not talking laptops. Yeah. Here, laptops can be a different animal. Yes, um, you can have a raised letter, uh, raised keyboard. Right there, you go. Uh, we can see that. Okay, and you're going to wait. Are you going to just tap that down on the table and then show us? All I, the did. I did. I oh, did, yeah. and nothing happened. Nothing yeah. I think my I think my cleaning lady every every two weeks she comes. I think she cleans everything. Oh. Wow, yeah. that's a good cleaning lady. Is she Polish? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, sure is. I'm married to a Polish cleaning lady, so <laughs> we've had her for years. I can attest how good of a job they do. Um, yeah, she all the all the pictures. You know, she's dusted the pictures because all my pictures are all caught. <laughs> we're going. We're going off have topic to go around about and cleaning the house. Move the pictures <laughs> back. <laughs> um. So back to uh, Terry, I, I, have you, is, oh, I was talking about a uh, laptop. Uh, I, I, yeah, well, you know, I got a uh, robot, you know, <laughs> no, yeah, no dust around here. Robot, yeah, robot. Uh, that's true. You probably have a, you're, you're, you're yeah, she's, uh, oh, yeah. she's a very good cleaner. Well, Lithuanian women are known for cleaning and uh, cooking. So, you know, they're it's a good uh, European. They're very, they're very desirable. You know? Right. Uh, so laptops, sometimes they have a raised keys that you can get access to, and other times they're flat and smooth, and you don't really get problems with debris getting underneath there. And if it does, you're SOL because the way they're designed. But laptops can be cleaned, too, in a very similar fashion, too, is turn the machine off, turn it upside down, and tap it a few times. And while it's upside down, then you could take some compressed air and shoot it and spray it underneath the keys, and that may help loosen whatever did accumulate in there. Um, when you reposition the, the keyboard, you may see hairs, that is animal hair or people hair, that have fallen out or become dislodged, but they're still stuck. So then you'll need to use something like a pair of tweezers to pull those things out, because anything that can get underneath your keys is going to interfere with the signal being connected and you getting a response from the keyboard. That is, when you press the letter M, does it actually register that you press the letter M? Well, I, I can imagine people that have dogs and cats probably really have a problem with the dander. Oh, yes. Uh, 
Question uh, on the file systems. What do Windows 10 and 11 use for file system? NTFS. Very same NTFS that it's always been since what, Windows what, NT. What you say, Bob? NTFS, same uh, system that it has been since Windows NT. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, I mean, there have been different versions. Back then, there have been different versions. There, there yeah. aren't like about what the fourth or the fifth version. It now? was the uh, 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 NT four two thousand were uh, NT four, and after that, I think it, uh, uh, somewhere in uh, uh, the XP uh, time frame, it became NT uh, S five. NTFS five. Okay, so they're in the fifth generation. But that's being specific. It still is a form of NTFS. Right. But they uh, uh, did some uh, enhancements uh, uh, in the version 5 over the 4. Mm -hmm. so yeah, but the file systems, you can, I, you can I read and write to and from those file systems with the same operating system. Yeah, okay. I, I saw it in like Apple and uh, Linux, you know, have their own file system. Yeah. They do. I They can. They usually do, but they don't have to. It can all well, be FAT32. There's an article that uh, uh, Sanford provided that, uh, you know, they, they all seem to have a different uh, file, except for the maybe the very latest last couple of years or whatever. I, Linux has actually at least four different file systems they're oh, using now oh, oh, and oh. they have varying uses actually it's more than four but uh that's a side point uh, there's at least, easy to lose there's at least four, four versions system. on a windows pc fat fat 32 extended fat and uh uh fat 16 ntfs4 yeah. ntsf5 so i mean all of the and Apple products, uh, there's uh, several different versions of uh, uh, what uh, is used in Apple, like uh, the APFS, but uh, uh, there's predecessors, and there's, yeah. uh, I think, something that uh, is being minute, created to replace APFS. Right. I, yeah, I, Apple has made a change from HFS to APFS. Right, yeah. which is Apple file system, which is different than... The NTFS. Yeah, uh, yeah. That is to say, you can't take a hard drive that's been formatted in an Apple and put it into a PC and expect the PC to be able to read it. And that's true with uh, a Linux. Any Linux system generally does not work in a Windows PC system, but in more recent years, they have made Linux versions that can coexist within an uh, NTFS operating system so those interchangeably can use their files between windows and a linux version that handles that uh, uh, characteristic well my experience has been that windows does a pretty good job of dealing with ntfs i but windows cannot handle the x file systems like x4 right, right. Or uh, the better FS uh, and uh, a few other ones. Yeah, butter FS and uh, ZFS and I. Uh, there's another one that I. There's I. Uh, there's another one that Linux uses. Those are a little bit more universal. Yeah. I uh, but they are basically found mostly on servers. Yeah, and you have uh, uh, under Linux uh, some of them. Uh, can uh, deal with uh, uh, the FAT file systems, or at least some of them, uh, that uh, uh, backport uh, to a, a Windows PC. But it it's all a variable. If you want to have data transferred between the various OSs, you have to have a independent uh, file format uh, that can transfer to the various operating system environments and uh, uh, have a program that can read those files. The, the easiest yeah. way to transfer between various systems is to actually go across the network. Right. Right, because then you're not, you're bypassing the operating system or and the hardware management system. Yeah. Let's see, there's FAT, 
NTFS, and there's a FAT12, a FAT16, a FAT32, and extended FAT. So you got right. about five FATs. Wow. That's a lot of layers of fat. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, the EX fat, that's the one that uh, a lot of USB sticks and memory cards, micro SD cards, might use. Uh, it does yeah. if they're uh, real large capacities, like uh, uh, a terabyte or something like that. Yes. Right. Uh, but you can also, on uh, those, if depending on what you're using those devices in, you can go NTFS there as well. So the one thing that's nice about the EXFAT is it eliminates the file size limit that you have on uh, older hard drives, or that is uh, FAT32, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. then NTFS is another way of doing it. Uh, so we got HPFS or that's, HFS. That's I don't the, know. Oh, that's, that's on old, That's the old Apple. Apple. Right? Yeah. And then you got the APFS that That's includes the trim management. Apple. And I never heard of the ZFS. That's uh, ZFS is Zettified File System. It was developed for very large files, such as big databases that are found on servers. Yeah. And uh, it's also very resilient. That and ButterFS both have internal redundancy so that if a sector is damaged, it can reconstruct and heal itself. Hmm. So yeah, they're very uh, resilient file systems. Yeah, ZFS is uh, for uh, like uh, an insurance company with uh, needs of petabytes. That's above terabytes. And zettabyte, for anybody who wants to know, is above petabyte. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, I B tree, B T R F S. That's better Butter uh, FS. FS. Butter FS. That's from Linux. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Butter FS is used by default in Fedora Linux. It's also uh, used uh, uh, in uh, 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 several uh, ones that I've got uh, uh, that are different versions uh, of uh, the OS. One of them, uh, 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 Garuda. Is, yeah, uh, that's also in one of those families that will use ButterFS and yeah. also uses, uh, does it use the RPM uh, package manager? No. Okay, so it's even different. Yeah. All right, so when I go and buy a hard drive and I need to format it, do I have to worry what type of format? system i want to use it's on a windows pc on a or windows just... system uh, uh generally speaking you're using uh, uh the ntfs because uh for starters you have a uh, 4k block size if you go to extended fat i forget what it is but it's much much bigger so uh Unless you're dealing with extremely big files on a consistent basis, say you have a 1K uh, uh, size file, but you may be taking uh, uh, eight or uh, more K for one block of uh, memory to hold 1K. So, so you're it, wasting space. Yeah, it, it's you're wasting tons of space. If you are consistent, like a, a high-res photos and lots and lots of them or videos now you uh, uh, might uh, uh, minimize your waste with xfat but generally overall ntfs uh, uh, seems to be the better way of going it'll even have less wasted space so if you buy a really large hard drive let's say a 14 terabyte hard drive oh, why not and 20 you and you format it using NTFS, you'll lose about a terabyte, and it's just rounding numbers, a terabyte just to the formatting procedure if you use NTFS. But if you use a different file format, would you not lose as much space to formatting? Uh, the formatting will uh, uh, be almost the same kind of a loss. It's a case of the size of the data blocks that your stuff goes into because 
everything's broken up into little blocks. And uh, uh, so a file may take one block, it may take 50 blocks that uh, uh, could be contiguous or broken up into uh, uh, scattered stuff called uh, file fragmentation. And bottom line is, uh, you will, uh, uh, depending on what you're storing on that drive in its format, may have greater waste other than NTFS. The file formatting, that's the infrastructure. If you bought farmland, it's all undeveloped. You're a developer. One of the first things you have to do is put in the infrastructure, the streets, the sewers, the storm drains, the water pipes, the gas lines, uh, etc. And that's before you even start building any houses or apartments or whatever the case may be. So okay. that's what so it that's matter, what format in that case it doesn't matter the file I'm sorry, the the formatting file format type does not matter it does not consume more or less of the hard drive there may be a little bit of difference but it's minor uh it's uh, uh the uh size of the blocks that are going to store your data uh okay ntfs might need more blocks than x uh, uh fat if you got real big files that you're storing but uh if you again have to st uh store a tiny uh, 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 text file that's 1K in size, you're going to be uh, uh, having a whole big empty gap you can't use because that's the extra space that's in that block holding that 1K file. Okay, San Sanford and Tim, the, the thing might be that when you've got that big of a drive, you've got so many blocks and your file allocation system has got to have a location for each one of those blocks. That's right. Okay. So if you've got 30 gazillion terabytes and you're breaking it up into 4K blocks, you've got to have a file location in the allocation table, whatever it's called, for each one of those blocks. Right. And that's got to that's the use space in the hard drive to do that. Well, uh, yeah, I and also that brings up by uh, GUID versus I uh, I MBR. I because GPT. the GUID is more efficient at doing that. The, you mean GPT? GPT. GPT GUID. LMNOP. Yeah. But anyway, that's more efficient than the older MBR. Oh, much, much, much more uh, efficient. You can have uh, uh, up to 200 and some odd uh, uh, primary partitions under GPT on a drive, whereas uh, uh, on a uh, uh, MBR, it's usually three and a logical partition. But if you're only going to need four, you can make four primary. But that's the limit, max. And as for how much space your uh, file system and your partitioning system will take up, I think the most efficient way is GPT with either NTFS or uh, one of the Linux file systems. That's GPT? GPT, which does the GUID partitioning. Yeah, anybody that's on Windows 10 or 11... <laughs> is on GPT partitioning. They came in with UEFI. Yeah, EFI is tied in usually with that. So any machine that knows uh, uh, UEFI is also using uh, GPT partitioning. It doesn't mean that you can't use an MBR formatted disk. I've done it plenty of times, but you can't do the reverse. You can't put a GPT partitioned disk into an old machine that only knows MBR partitioning. Right. Well, you had a lot of acronyms that just came out of this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but oh, that's... my God. I, I think I need a scorecard here to keep up with these. We had, <laughs> what we have? G 
G G U I D G P T M B R A P F S blocks. That's B uh, N uh, B L O C K. Come yeah. on, what else did we have there? Look at the uh, uh, medicine, uh, law, no, 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 engineering, no, no, just stay on the subject. besides uh, computers, had, there, uh, there are a lot acronyms. of acronyms. There's a the, lot of acronyms here that just came out of this, just this one subject that Terry brought up. Well, like, shame on Terry. <laughs> no, no, yeah, no. The, the file system types have about seven of them, seven basic terms. And I... The partitioning types have about two to four different terms that are associated with them. E, can I do a, a sidebar? You're in a Y. Did you ever visit that town that burned down and started with an L? But I. I uh, you know you mean? Yeah, that town that burned down completely. Did you, did you ever go visit it or no? I've stayed away from that side of the island for the most part. Oh, you haven't? Uh, yeah, I, it was terrible. I thought maybe you're. You know, visit it or whatever. You know. I I I know some people over there, or I uh, I knew a couple businesses over there. Luckily, the one business that I dealt with a lot, uh, his building was still standing at the end, and so was his whole development. Uh, it did not take everything down all the way. It took the old town by the shore down. Because a lot of that was all uh, turn of the century wood construction. And wood construction here didn't have any fire breaks in the walls. And the walls in the houses were like two and a half inch studs. And they had a, uh, a fiber board on both sides with no insulation in the middle. Hmm. So it was a tinder box. Well, they didn't need insulation. What? You didn't need much insulation. <laughs> they don't heat here and unless it's a commercial space they don't air condition I, I, that's what I kind of yeah. indicating you know leaning towards is not much of a heating season and not much of a cooling season well the uh, and they uh, what, don't have much of the structure to support it either what uh, uh, Peter's uh, describing uh, describes the uh, uh, same construction in a sense that uh, uh, was in Tokyo during World War II Absolutely, absolutely. Look what happened to it. It looked like it got hit yeah. by a nuclear bomb, and it didn't. It yeah, that's was what, all burned that's down. What God, that's what Godzilla does when he blows his yeah. blows <laughs> in Tokyo. Hey, there were uh, 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 a lot of people uh, killed by uh, firestorms. Yep. Okay, yeah. let's let's stay on subject here. We do we sidebar. We need to get back onto topic here. Uh, we have some other things on our list. Would someone else like to bring up another topic that's on there that we could discuss? USA, uh, USB A versus USB C. What's the difference? Okay, that's third that's from the bottom. And I can tell you right off the top of my head that USB-C can do things that USB-A never did. It wasn't supposed to. <laughs> That's right. USB-C isn't just data transfer. It does other things. I'm just waiting for this to pop up here. All right. USB... A versus C. Also, the uh, uh, article right after uh, that one... Uh, uh, Looks like a pretty good uh, article for some folks. Just can't get this to come. Okay, what is USB A? Okay, maybe I got this this time. <clears throat> There was actually a USB Type B at one time, but you're never going to see it these days. <laughs> USB, oh US USB USB dash B. Yeah, that's You'll never that's see it anymore. Terraport. That is, um, you still see it. Isn't it? I I had some hard drives that had that. 
Right. Um, I think um, I had some external uh, CD or DVD players yep. for our laptops that would still use that interface. Yeah. And I don't understand why. It's a very slow interface, but I guess those devices don't need a fast interface. Well, the uh, uh, D uh, uh, interface is for device, and it was used on even some printers as well. But there's also a US uh, uh, B uh, micro B connection. And okay, so with the A is this big flat part. Correct. That right? rectangle. Yeah. yeah. Blow that up. You can yep. see that. That is typical on many of the cables we had bought pre prior to USB C. You can find USB C's that have C on one end and A on the other end because it was a little more easy to, a little more universal. Yes. Well, And there's, a, there's also a difference between the ones that have the white plastic versus the blue plastic, and some of them had yellow. And that's the difference between the Generation 2 and Generation 3. Okay, the USB B cable is the... What what was used for the printers? Yeah, that's the square right. one again, and it is still used in electronics for things like Arduinos and Raspberry Pi and stuff like that to power through and to connect. Yep. So it's not totally. Uh, not totally dead. As they totally. used, as they used to say in Monty Python, not dead yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> All right. So the here's a C. They're not showing you the end of the cable, uh, but basically, I don't know. It kind of looks rounded on both ends. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they're both okay. C's. So you know, it's a just a big oval. Now you know, it looks like a lightning port with the wires on the inside. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, Lightning and Thunderbolt are pretty much the same thing, except the size was a little bit different on Thunderbolt uh, on Lightning. I think they were a little bit flatter. <clears throat> also, here's a, one of the more interesting points about USB-C is the amount of juice that it can handle. It says here, oh, yeah. 100, what are 100 watts and 20 volt connection? Yep. Some can handle even more than 100 watts, but generally up to 100 watts at 20 volts, and that can charge a laptop easily. Uh-huh. And then you get Thunderbolt 3 and 4 there yep. uh, that give you higher uh, data transfer rates. Yeah. Uh, you're talking, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, 3 is up to 40 uh, uh uh, gigabits and uh, terabyte four. Is, I mean, uh, Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt four Thunderbolt. is higher. Thunderbolt four is, I think, as much as eighty. Yeah, I think so too. And that's about as high as they go these days until USB four comes out. Yeah. Then uh, uh, the sky's the limit. Almost. But anyway, uh, they've also renumbered 3 as for whether it's 3.0, 3.1, or 3.2, gen whatever. Yeah. Those numberings have changed. Yeah, but it's not consistent on uh, uh, who's providing the uh, uh, nomenclature because I still see uh, uh, 3.1, gen 1, or 3.1, gen 2 even though there's uh, 3.2 that's supposed to be only Gen 2. 3.2, uh, there was a Gen 1, but nowadays you'll only see 3.2 Gen 2. I never saw the uh, Gen 1 on 3.2. I only saw the uh, uh, Gen 2 at 10. 3.2 .2 Gen 1 is the new name for USB I3. Point one, I think. The old three point one. 
Hmm. And 3.0 is USB 3.1 Gen 2, Gen okay, so 1 or Gen 2. Let's, let's talk one about those. practicality here. Um, USB-A versus USB-C. Yeah. The practicality is USB-C is the more modern version, and you want to go that route. <laughs> it's the practicality. If you have cabling to support it, you have a device that supports it. Um, it's a more standard device, a uh, set standard. And I believe USB-C is the new adopted standard in Europe. Yes. But so uh, I think, wasn't it the uh, you, yeah, I'm sorry. European Union decided to force Apple to switch to USB-C yes. instead of Thunderbolt or their, their proprietary uh, cables that they used to use. Actually, they were using, uh, they were using Lightning. Lightning, right. Thank you. The, Thunderbolt is a, uh, is a variety of USB-C. And you have to uh, really watch it on USB-C that we didn't have to on USB-A uh, cables. Uh, the quality of the cable very much can determine the data handling rate speed. If you get the wrong uh, uh, cable, and let's say you had uh, uh, the equivalent of Thunderbolt 3, uh, or four, if you don't have the right cable, you won't get the performance uh, uh, capabilities of Thunderbolt 3 and 4. Uh, even uh, uh, as something as simple as uh, uh, USB 3.2 Gen 2 uh, at 10 uh, 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 gigabits per second uh, can suffer if it doesn't have a decent cable. So cable uh, on uh, USB-C, uh, the quality is very important. This is becoming true also in HDMI cables as well. And also in USB-C, there are different numbers of pins, at least in Thunderbolt, there are different numbers of pins that are active. Some cables have fewer than the maximum possible numbers, and that affects whether or not they can do different things. And probably whether they can charge a device or, tra or traverse enough, I'm sorry, throughput, enough power through it. Would that be a consideration here? So a cheaper, a cheaper cable can't charge I, There are other functions as well, like carrying video. I And also I... Yes, the data transfer speed, and also being, I uh, usually what will happen is you'll have some USB-C cables that are charge only and don't carry data. And those have some of the pins disable, uh, disabled as well. That's been uh, true on uh, uh, cables for smartphones uh, uh, as far back as I can remember. Most of them are two-wire cables instead of four-wire cables. Those are for charging your phone only. If you want to use a transfer of data from your phone via cable to your uh, computer, you have to have the four-wire cable or five-wire. I don't remember which it is. But it's four or five-wire uh, cable. That handles charging as well as transferring the data in and out of the phone to the computer. Is that... For all um, Android and piece, uh, I'm sorry, Android and Apple, or is that only an Apple problem? That's only a, a, a mostly an Android problem, but uh, uh, in uh, uh, Apple, they get around it with uh, uh, like the Lightning cable, which does both. Anyhow, that's why the cable costs more. I do remember cheaper Lightning cables did charging only and did not that do could data. That could be too, yeah. but they, I don't think they caught on as much as uh, uh, it was with the uh, regular uh, Apple uh, uh, cables. Because uh, uh, generally speaking, when you're uh, dealing with, um, uh, say, Android devices a lot, almost every cable you pick up is just a charging cable. It's got two wires, that's it. And uh, uh, whereas most lightning cables you pick up, have a, a charging and data capability 
because that was the vast majority of what they wanted out there. And and you did bring up a, a good point there. M many of the Android cables you get with uh, portable devices that uh, that you use, that you only charge up via that cable that comes with it. And it's usually a very short cable that's wrapped up. That is for things like flashlights of, of various sources or a, a uh, powered device, a fan or whatever. They'll give you a charging cable, but it does not handle data whatsoever. That's right. That's very, very true. And there's lots of those. I have a Box full well, of them. what gets me is uh, uh, I've been looking for, uh, uh, I've got one uh, four or five wire uh, uh, USB cable uh, for uh, uh, transferring something from an Android. And uh, I got dozens and dozens of the charging cables. And I'd like to almost take a, a, a day and take a, a go through all the cables, take all the charging cables and throw them away. <laughs> it, it, it's enough to drive you nuts I actually had a, a, a client that uh, needed to transfer and he couldn't figure out why it wasn't working with his cable because every yeah. one of the cables he had were charging cables no data cables and yeah. I had one I found mm -hmm. and I can't find it anymore because I didn't mark the damn thing <laughs> you want to try that uh, uh, next article uh, after that uh, Pete, Pete had a comment. Yes, yeah, so so I use our Arduinos a lot, and there's three cables that they use for the Arduinos: the Mini, uh, the Micro, and the B, the the B. So what I did is I took the three USB cables and checked them out and made sure that they were correct, that they were data cables. And I wire tied those three together, and I keep that in the bag with the Arduinos. Mm -hmm. So now I got four cables that can go from the, any PC to any Arduino, and I put uh, color coded uh, zip ties on the, both ends of the cables, so I know which one of the A's are the correct one for a particular end. Okay, Tom. Yeah, you guys are talking about the C cables, and there are two types of C's, the mini C and the standard USB C's. No. I haven't heard of a mini uh, versus a, a, a standard size. I've only known one size C, period. That, correct. On C, I, I mean, I support that. I've never heard of a mini C. I've seen mini A's. Yeah. But no. There are A's that are flat, and there are A's that are fat. Right. Okay, the uh, C that you were showing, uh, Stanford, that looked like it was small, yep. was nicely rolled up and a small end on it, that was the mini C cable. Nope, there's only one USB-C, and that was C. it. These are real tiny. A uh, uh, USB-C regular is uh, uh, that uh, what he's uh, showing you there, and it's uh, one size fits all. That's it. It's the only way that comes, and that's the nice thing. It's a pretty much standard. I've only seen it come this way for USB-C. Right. Yeah. Um, and the well, other thing, about, the other thing about USB-C is there's no upside or no downside. Right, one right side up. They're yeah, universal. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, the, I guess the, the other question I'll add to that is uh, the standard USB, the rectangular ones, they have a, a white, a black, and a blue. Right. I know of. Yes. Yep. There was, right. a, there was a first gen, and there was a second gen, and there was a third gen. And the third gen is the blue, second gen is white, and the black was sometimes used in the first gen. Okay, well, I thought the third gen, the blue one, I believe that was the uh, the C. Am I wrong no, that? that's no. USB Type A three. Correct. It's okay. three dot or three dot one. Usually three dot one. It's a different no. spec. Uh, Pete was trying to show us one. What did Pete? We didn't get no, to see so that. So this is USB Micro and USB mi Mini, all connected back to A. Yes. Micro and Mini A. Right. 
Right. So the A, so the micro looks a little bit and can be sometimes confused if you're not careful with this because it's really close to the same size. But it's trapezoidal rather than uh, rounded on the ends. Yeah. Yeah, very rounded. Almost. Yeah, I recognize that one. So, yep. so this is trapezoidal, and that's the the micro. Right. And the uh, uh, mini looks uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, kind of like an A type uh, 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 connector yeah. because it's got a large uh, uh, empty area above the it's actual the connections. Right. Got yeah. it. I got it. Thank you. You, you, Pete, you almost poked my eye out. I got it all the way over here. I was hurting. <laughs> I, by the way, I Type C hard drives. Yes, there is a Type C end on that cable that is really flat and broad. I, that is true for several of my USB. I, it's USB three, but it's USB it is still a Type A connector. Yeah, it, it's used on on the standalone backup drives a lot. Right. Yeah, and that's just like a slot. It's a flat one, and it's got it's, it's got a it notch in it. Like a it has a notch in the uh, cable in. Yeah. It, yeah, that's right. I don't know how well you would like be able to see it. But display port. And that ah, one, it looks okay, like yeah. a what double uh, uh, cable, and uh, uh, all it is is a notch in between two sections. Those are uh, used on the uh, uh, data uh, backup drives that are external in most right. cases. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, I've seen backup drives that use a standard uh, uh, USB 3.0. Type A connector. So, yeah. what do you call that? What do you call that connector there? That's actually a uh, a, uh, 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 considered a Type C connector, but it's uh, uh, not the standard C. That's a standard C that uh, Tom's holding up there, just right. like you did. Those are standard yeah. C's. But uh, yeah. what I uh, held up that now that's a Type A three. Yeah, it, it, the standard C plugs into that one. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the one I held up is usually uh, uh, used on uh, backup drives or external drives most of the time. It separates uh, 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 power uh, uh, supply requirements from data uh, requirements. And now that allows more throughput? Well, yes and no. Uh, I don't know that it affects uh, uh, the throughput at all. It's more of a case of trying to uh, uh, give you, uh, your drive external the power it needs along with uh, 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 being able to transfer the data in and out. And they just segregate it. And it's notched so that uh, uh, there's only one way to put that in, just like a type A only has one way you can put that in. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other end of those is usually a USB type A. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll be, usually those occur in drives that are uh, Gen 3. Mm-hmm. That's true. I've got, I've got USB-C outlets on the back seat in my car. And I think that's strictly just for power. Could be. Yeah, probably for charging. Probably for yeah. charging. Uh, yeah. Let's get a digital sound system, and then you can drop a, a an adapter sort of like this guy, which has got the male yeah. female on it, and you may be able to put a USB drive in there, a thumb drive, to go through your, your sound system on your car. Check your radio instructions. Which you brought up, Wayne, you brought up a point about the USB uh, C ports in the car. Uh, my brother, Rick, was down in, uh, down in Florida, rented a car, and he, the car only had USB C ports on the car. 
and he did not have any USB-C ports, so he had to quickly go out and go get the yep. one. <laughs> he had to plug his phone and, and charge up his phone yep. in the car. Yeah. Or use other devices, whatever he wanted to use in the car. Uh, it was just he was not expecting that, and it was a last-minute thing that he suddenly <laughs> ran across. So be aware that this is the new standard, and you're going to run. You may want to go and incorporate a few USB-C cables in your household for future or current use. By my front, in the front of my car, I've got the regular USB, you know, the uh, a. a, you know, and I can plug my phone into there and, yeah, and that's, transfer. Th that's data. what uh, uh, is changing. All the ports will be Type C. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a good thing. Yeah, depending on uh, your point of view. Standardize this stuff so we don't have to carry these cables or deal with, am I putting it upside down in upside down or right side up? Which way does it go? You're not looking at it as you're driving and you're trying to shove it into that thing and it won't go. Good. You're getting frustrated and then you have an accident because so, you couldn't put the, cable, yeah. put the cable in. Good. <laughs> and then you were distracted driving, so they add $200 to your ticket for the accident. That's right. You're distracted. And uh, uh, wait until the insurance company gets a hold of the information and look at your premiums. Tell you, yeah, look at your premiums. Okay, we got time for one more topic. You want to try that next article after the one you just did? Uh, what makes your computer run like new? Yeah. There might be a few people that uh, uh, can take advantage of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not very many people, well, some people do have hard drives, conventional hard drives, which they could defragment. But there's a lot of other things you can do. Well, okay. I just cleared, a, I just cleared out a whole bunch of storage. Usually they uh, um, tell you if you want it to run like new, take out the spinning hard drive, put in the SSD. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah. Definitely want to do that. You don't want to do what they're doing in this picture, and that is take the hard drive out and put a screwdriver on it. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> this is not something I don't know why they're showing us this picture. This is not how you defragment a hard drive. <laughs> well, that's in a, 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 a what's called a clean environment uh, uh, room, and you got to have uh, on a mask uh, uh, something on your head, usually a, a jacket, to try and minimize contamination all right but we're not doing that why not we are not doing that for the sake of conversation here only good thing that comes out of that picture is now you've got two or three really good rescue mirrors or shaving mirrors for camping <laughs> um yeah they could become good disc coasters too um does I'm assuming everybody here in this group knows how to defragment a hard drive. If you don't, it's real simple. You go to the we could I could pull it up, but basically I think we've gone through this before. You put you call up the, the drive letter, you choose right click and choose properties, and go to the, your tools, and one of the tools is going to be defragment the hard drive. On a SSD, it's going to perform the trim function instead of defragmenting. And that's, we'll leave that at that quick subject there because we've covered this many times before. Um, what else are they telling here? Oh, of course, get rid of bloatware. <laughs> and uh, get rid of your background, things that are running in the background. Yes. Well, uh, that's uh, the funny thing. There's uh, another one there that uh, uh, I think the last article is about uh, uh, too many uh, background processes and how to uh, control it, but I think that's exactly. over most people's head. Okay. Uh, clean out your storage. That does not mean take the hard drive out, take the covers off, and clean it out. All right? <laughs> Again, we talked about that. Uh, look for duplicate files. That is, if you have a tendency to make copies on top of copies, look for those copies. If you copy large folders onto itself or make backups of something, 
on your own machine, that will slow you down. Um, Very large files, full uh, recycle bin, temporary files galore. Uh, Windows itself, and uh, uh, not uh, uh, just the programs, uh, but the operating system creates tons of temporary files to do something, uh, uh, and then they uh, uh, stop using that file, and there's nothing that does an automatic cleanup. Right. Which uh, me. So, so let's see what else. Make sure you take out any malware that might be on your machine if you should have it. Pop-ups that come up in ads, they could throw more crap in there. Um, let's see. Visual Make sure your antivirus is up to date and not turned off. Make sure your computer is uh, protected. Why this article is talking about XP, I don't know. <laughs> In there, I'm trying to make this quick because uh, we're running out of time for the evenings. Make yeah. sure Windows is updated. Yeah, there's people that shut off the updating. All right. Anything else anyone wanted to add to this article and something else we might have missed? If you are I'm doing on short term backups on your hard drive. I did my first uh, electric plug in uh, tax credit today. A guy bought a $50,000. Uh, you know, uh, electric plug-in, and you got a 15% uh, income tax credit for it. So, so for your, all your environmental guys. <laughs> so what does that have to do with uh, speeding up your PC? Beats the hell out of me. I don't know. He, he, did, he went segue over here. Yeah, <laughs> well, I go segue. Terry, yeah, I, Terry don't tell me this. Yeah. Don't. Terry, are you saying this is the first customer you've dealt with that have bought an electric car? Yeah, we did a ta yeah, tax return, yeah. This is the first customer you've dealt with that has bought an electric car? Well, we got the 15, yeah, well, they just put the credit in last year, so this is second year for the credit, yeah. Okay, and now did the state of Illinois put a tax credit back in place too? Yeah, this is just a federal, not, not to do with the state. What, what happened at the sta state level? I don't know. We don't know. Well, yeah, why yet. don't? You're supposed to know this Well, I, I, that's probably done with the dealer. You know, <laughs> we, we just do tax returns. We're the doing, dealers we don't, don't do. We don't, we don't, do we don't get involved with dealers. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Pete, you had something you wanted to comment on this? Yeah. Uh, if, if you're doing, like, copy backups on the hard drive on your machine, let's say you have a second second hard drive that you're doing backups to, make sure you you clean out the the, the the past backups on a cycle. I ran into this with the Linux because I was using time shift and it totally filled up my drive even though I thought I had to check to remove after five backups. Yeah, generally you don't need to keep backups from three years ago. Correct. And this isn't even three years ago. This was just. Right. And I'll say generally, in Terry's case, he needs to keep backups for eight to 10 years. But that's a different story. You yeah. know, that's for, you know, financial purposes or business purposes. Uh, but for our home use, we don't need to keep those records as long other than financials that have to do with the IRS. So Terry, I, how long I, do we have? Terry, how long do we have to keep our copies of our tax returns for? Seven years. Seven years. Uh, well, yeah. It's, it, yeah. Uh, something shady. It, it, well, it, it's on, if you got payroll, maybe longer, but, you know, maybe three, five, seven. It, either three, five, seven, depending on, you know, what, what's involved with your tax return. Like payroll, maybe seven, and... You know, just simple return in three years, you know. And what about bankruptcies? Well, well I... Uh, How long do you have to keep those records for? Well, you know, uh, you, 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 can, you, can, you can't refile uh, bankruptcy only once every seven years. So, uh, you know, so a, a lot of our clients, you know, are, well, a few of them, you know, that, you know, they, they they got to wait seven years to file bankruptcy again. Okay, but the, so you're saying they got to keep those records for seven years? 
I would I would think so. That's really you know yeah I would think so. Okay. All right. Nothing else. Um, what I do, Pete? They, you know, if if you have a twenty year history of fraud, they can go back uh, <laughs> twenty years. Pete, you were saying? Yeah. So what what I do at the end of the tax season, and sometimes even in the middle while I'm doing it, because I use like tax cut, I I will use a USB drive and copy both the PFDs and a copy of the actual program files onto the USB drive and keep that with the paper documents. Okay. That way, if something should happen to the PC, I've got all the documents on a USB stick. Uh, you better be careful, Peter. USB sticks use flash drives. That uses an electric charge to uh, retain your data. You have to uh, uh, periodically install that uh, uh, drive into a machine, even if you don't do anything with the data, the, by installing it into a live computer, it's putting an electrical charge back in to strengthen the charge that holds your data. Okay, thank you for that. Otherwise, uh, it uh, uh, deteriorates. It's kind of like an optical disc uh, that's exposed to sunlight degrades, especially if it's ones that you uh, uh, bought at the store and you did your own writing versus the commercially made uh, uh, optical disc. Uh, the difference in life is uh, at least twice as much uh, with a commercial over uh, your... Uh, self-burn uh, type optical drive and same uh, uh, can hold true for a floppy disk if you're still using those floppies Flop. okay uh any other last questions or comments i would like to thank everybody for attending sanford can you hold on i want to do a sidebar with you on real estate commissions all right okay all right but um Thanks everyone for attending uh, the April edition of Tips and Tricks, and we'll see everybody at the next meeting. Which is the next meeting coming up, Tim? Uh, next Tuesday is the uh, South Suburban uh, uh, Computer Club. On Thursday of next week is Northwest Computer Club. And uh, the following uh, uh, Tuesday is uh, the Linux SIG. Okay. Thank you. So